Welcome back everyone to our final session of our Veterans and Civic Education Conference. This session is the Communities Need Veterans and Veterans Need Communities. Again, I'd really like to thank my colleague, Sean Riley for organizing such a dynamic event and extend my gratitude to Mary Margaret Holden for ensuring such sharp execution of each of these sessions. So many of you may know Tim Carney from his column at the Washington Examiner, or even his work at American Enterprise Institute. Others may know him from his 2019 book, Alienated America. This stunning assessment offered deep insight into deteriorating communities across the country. Counties that had lost all hope as their civic institutions like VSOs withered along with marriages, voting, church attendance and volunteerism. Today, Tim will talk about the ways veteran, veterans can help restore this fabric of civil society. Before I yield to Tim, please make sure that you submit any questions you may have using the Q&A feature. Tim, thanks again for joining us. We're excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you all of you for, for spending part of your day with us. Um, to, the stories I want to talk about today have to do with community, have to do with the concept of the American dream, and specifically how that is lived and experienced by veterans. And I'm going to start in West Allis, Wisconsin, which is right outside of Milwaukee. Now, and if you guys have questions, throw them at me in the in the Q and A, and I'll I'll get to them just when the uh, when the time is right. But so West Allis, I was there to cover a Trump event in 2016 in the primaries before the, the Wisconsin primary there. And I met a man, I walked all the way up to the front of this line and I met a man named CJ LaRock. He was a 100% disabled vet from Vietnam. The unit he, he was from, he was in, he told me it was called the Red Devils. Um, I asked him what he did in Vietnam and he laughed. He said, I did everything I was asked to. And he was in a wheelchair that day at the, at the Trump rally. He had lost use of his legs due to exposure to Agent Orange. And this also contributed to all sorts of other health maladies. And at one point, he told me he had had a heart attack, uh, shown up at the VA hospital. They told him he didn't have a heart attack. Eventually, he came back and got a quadruple bi bypass. And he's, uh, he told me how he was struggling to get the VA to pay for it. And... Most of this conversation I was having with CJ or his buddy at the front of the line there, David Siminski, was them talking about getting mistreated and sort of left out, mistreated by VA, mistreated by President Obama, mistreated by his congressman, who was Paul Ryan, mistreated by his governor, who was Scott Walker. Bipartisan <laughs> mistreatment was the story from CJ and David. And I, I wrote about the story at the time, but I was listening to the interview again, driving in. It was still on my phone. I was playing it over my car. And three details that I hadn't noticed uh, jumped out at me. First was that sort of telling CJ's story the whole time was his friend, David Siminski, who had brought him there to the rally to help him because CJ was in a wheelchair, who had brought him to the town hall with Paul Ryan weeks before and actually stood up and asked the question, on CJ's behalf. And when CJ told about his heart attack and he got sent home from the hospital, it was the next day a friend walked in, saw how bad he looked. And as CJ put it, the friend walked into his house just to check on him. And that checking on him and then bringing him to the hospital might've saved his life. And there's another thing CJ told me, and it was, again, in way of, of talking about how the system wasn't working for him, his son-in-law had been in the Marines and couldn't find a job. But the amazing thing was CJ was able to pay rent for himself and for his daughter and, and the son-in-law. So this story of the mistreatment by the sort of nameless, faceless, bureaucratic system, at the same time, his life being saved and uh, brought some meaning by a close-knit network of friends. But also at the same time, he actually was getting the money he needed and more than the money he needed. And I think that that sort of encapture, encapsulates a lot of what's going on with veterans in America today. We have built up a great system to make sure that money-wise, our veterans are as well taken care of as any veterans in the history of the world. But 
what they need the most, immersion in strong, tightly knit communities can be very spotty. And they're certainly not going to get that human level attention from this massive faceless in-person uh, uh, bureaucracy. And so I think that there's two story arcs told here, two stories of, of loss. The first loss is the loss of community and the rise of alienation in the United States from say 1960 to today. The second loss is specifically the loss of community that veterans experience when they leave the military and enter this increasingly alienated landscape of the US. So first, my book was titled Alienated America, and that's where I made the argument, similar argument to one made by Robert Putnam 20 years earlier in Bowling Alone, that Americans just, we don't belong to as many things. We aren't as connected to our next door neighbors. We aren't as connected to institutions of civil society. The very thing that Alexis de Tocqueville said makes America so unique, is the very thing that was becoming less and less common for the average American to experience. Um, some data I dug up uh, from 1900 to 1930, you had an increasing membership in organizations across the US, uh, but then it fell during the Great Depression and then rebounded massively after World War II. Robert Putnam and Bowling Alone said, across all sorts of organizations, membership in the US, membership rates just skyrocketed until 1957, they kind of peaked, but then very slowly and then pretty steadily after Vietnam, there was a sustained decline in what percentage of Americans belong to something like a PTA, a bowling league, a church, etc. cetera. Uh, Putnam's research was followed up Mike Lee's office in uh, the Joint Economic Committee. They went ahead and did a, a study of what they call associational life. They found similar results that people just aren't as uh, tied in and associated. Uh, sociologist uh, Ivalo Petev wrote, Americans growing isolation is corroborated in the case of extended networks. We see evidence for the decrease in formal and informal ties. Uh, and um, people go to church less every year. We belong to fewer organizations than our, our parents did. We know our neighbors less than a generation ago. We vote less than we did a generation ago. Men are less likely to have a job and less likely to even be in the labor force than they were a generation or two. Americans marry less than we did in 1960 and we have fewer and fewer children every year. We are less connected to one another and the consequences are bad. I already pointed to a couple of them. I believe that the retreat from marriage and the declining childbirth rate is due to the fact that we don't belong to as many things. It, as a wise woman once put it, it takes a village to raise a child. My wife and I, we have six kids. We constantly rely on our church communities, our extended family, that sort of thing. I, the programs that I run at my parish, the T-ball program, is explicitly for the purpose of parents bringing their kids somewhere and ignoring the kids while they get to hang out with other adults. This is something you need community in order to be a sane parent. You're less likely to get married less likely to have children if you don't have that. And then also economic immobility is driven by the collapse of community. There's many studies on that, that the kids who rise from the bottom quintile to the top, the number one predictor of that is, do they live in a community that has strong institutions, libraries, public schools, churches, et cetera, and many other intact families with two parents at home. And of course, alcoholism, drug addiction, and suicide the deaths of despair that we've heard a lot about, they are very much driven by and predicted by whether there's people belonging to institutions, institutions staying together, volunteering, all those measures of strength of community cohesion predict deaths of despair. And so that's not happening across all of America universally, right? We are still the most sort of associational society on some, by some measures. And where I found real exceptions when I was working, either covering the last two campaigns or working on Alienated America, um, the two villages I highlight in the beginning of my book are the village of Oostburg, Wisconsin, and the same trip where I went to West Alice, I went up to, or a, a later trip, I went up to Oostburg, where everybody's Dutch, everybody's named Holly Vander something, etc. They all go to the Christian Reformed Church or the Reformed Church of America, 
which as a Irish Catholic, I accidentally confused at one point and uh, got in a little bit of trouble with the locals. But there's two other Christian Reformed church in this village of 2000, incredibly tightly knit community, Christian schools, public schools, local diners, packed. People know their neighbors. The, the woman behind the counter at the diner, people were bringing her food when I was there because she had hand surgery coming up in a couple of days. Now, most of you probably know what that's like. You've probably had your fridge be overflowing with lasagnas and casseroles and that sort of thing if you had a child or broke a bone or lost a loved one. I've had a friend who said when he got diagnosed with cancer, he had to give away food because people, why are you giving me food, Bob? Oh, I got diagnosed with cancer. And so I have too much in my freezer from all my friends bringing it to me. That's a very common experience for people in very strong religious communities. The other type of place I saw, the other village, same size as Oostburg, Chevy Chase, Maryland. Not exactly built around a church. Now people do go to church. You go to Brett Kavanaugh's parish, Blessed Sacrament. The pews are pretty full there, but more broadly, people there belong to stuff. Families get, couples get married, they have kids, they coach their kids in Little League, they're in their, uh, the PTAs or the public schools or very involved in their children's private schools. So the rest of America is where you see the alienation. Outside of the upper middle class, heavily college educated places like Chevy Chase, and outside of these rare middle class, very religious communities, Mormon communities, Orthodox Jewish communities, these Dutch reform communities, a few Catholic parishes, outside of those, people are far, far less connected to their neighbors than Americans were 15, 30 years ago. And so that is the landscape into which people land, especially working class and middle class Americans when they leave the military. So this is the second half of the story, right? That, that alienation is much more shocking for someone coming from the military. The sort of intimacy, closeness, purpose, all of that that you get in the military is so intense that it's a massive shock to land back in this alienated landscape. And again, military disproportionately working class in the US, um, especially among enlisted. And there you have, um, that's where you have the alienation. That's where you have the retreat from marriage, the collapsing PTAs, the closing churches, et cetera. Not across the board, but far, far more than, than other communities. So what's lost? I'm not a veteran. I'm not gonna be an expert on this, but I have spent a lot of my time either in, out on the campaign trail or just um, you know preparing for this, talking to other veterans, and I'll, I'll tell you what they tell me. Number one is camaraderie. Uh, I talking to a friend of mine who he was in Iraq and Afghanistan. His father was in Vietnam and uh, he had relatives who went off to World War II. He said, when they came back from World War II, they deployed, when they went to World War II, they deployed as a unit and they came home as a unit and they took a boat home. So you could think of this as a psychiatrist of like the decompression of, of the journey home from the Pacific or, or from Europe. Um, but also, there's just the, uh, the idea that at the unitness persisted after the service. The camaraderie sort of naturally flowed into the uh, civilian life. And then his father in Vietnam said, you know, one day he's in a jungle and then literally the next day he's walking around the Bronx and just that would be disorienting to anybody. But then just he got sent there. And then when the number of days had passed, he got sent back and all his friends were still either had been sent back much earlier or were still off there in the jungle. And that that idea that you should be expected without these men that you just went through this uh, experience with, that you should be expected to adjust is just not not human. It's not reasonable. Um, the camaraderie of landing alone back in a place where people don't necessarily understand you. This is what VFW and American Legion halls were for, that you could go in there and either talk about what you've been through or not even need to talk about what you've been through. But for the, especially the post 9-11 veterans in America, those American Legion halls are disappearing. There's not an interest in them. We could talk about why, um, but the, uh, 
but there's certainly a lot less um, participation in that sort of old school, we're gonna sit at the bar um, kind of thing. And so then the camaraderie though is, is only part of it. R role is another one. Uh, my colleague here, Yuval Levin, he wrote a great book recently called A Time to Build. And there he says, one of the things that institutions of community do is they give people a role. They say, this is your job. And in that, I'm thinking about two stories that both have to do with sports. I love sports. One uh, is just on role playing. I, there was this time I was watching a baseball game. I was a middle schooler or a JV player and I was watching the varsity team and there's runners on first and second and nobody out. And the number two hitter in the batting order came up as his tie game in the in the last inning and he squares around and he lays down a bunt and it's a perfect sacrifice bunt he just squares around gives himself up after he bunts it he runs as fast as he can to first but he knows he's going to get out he gets thrown out he was greeted by his teammates as a conquering hero because guess what he had a role and he did it he gave himself up and played that role i still remember the look on his face after he came back to the dugout i still remember the crowd going around him and I thought, this is how you can be confident in yourself. This is how you can sort of build up your own sort of self-esteem, as they say, is you're given a role and you pull it off. Increasingly in American society, if you don't belong to something, you don't necessarily have a role. If you get a gig economy job, well, every time you deliver something, you get a little bit of money. It's simply transactional. It's not that you have a role as being part of something bigger. When you're on a team like that, there's no separation between the individual and the whole. And nowhere is that more clear than in military, especially in combat. But again, in our modern society or modern economy, that idea of I belong to this institution and I have a role can be lost. And so I was reading um, uh, testimonies from veterans who said, that was the biggest problem. I came home and I, I didn't know where I fit in. I didn't know what I was supposed to do next. And that I think leads to a lot of the mental illness problems, a lot of, um, a lot of the antisocial problems, et cetera, that, that veterans can encounter. Uh, the other idea of a role though, is uh, if you belong to a church or you belong to a swimming pool, you know the look of the person who's coming up to you to try to rope you into volunteering for something. Unless you are that person, in, in which case you know how to give that look. But I still remember that after, after mass one day at my parish St. Andrews in, in Silver Spring, Maryland, I saw the athletic director walking towards me with that look, the CYO director. And he got to me before I could escape. And he said, Tim, I see... Uh, Meg is playing basketball. I said, yep, yep, she is. He says, the good news is we've got enough girls from the parish that we can field the team. I said, that's great. He said, except that we need a coach. I said, I can think of some guys who've coached basketball before. He said, no, Tim, I, I need you to be the coach. Now, Meg was in kindergarten at the time. <laughs> kindergarten basketball should not exist, right? Um, my daughter had only signed up. Uh, my wife had only signed her up, I think, because her best friend was going to be on the team. And so I I said, Mike, you know, any other year I would do this. I'm really busy this year. He said, why? Is something wrong? I said, no, it's, it's, uh, I'm writing a book, actually. He said, what's the book about? I said, well, it's about the importance of community organization. And yeah, so you can guess what happens next. I become the kindergarten girls basketball coach for St. Andrew Apostle. Not because I'm a good person who's selfless, but because I belong to things where they say, we need somebody to do this. You are one of us. You can play that role. People without these institutions to belong to feel they don't have a role and a purpose. But bigger than role and purpose, which can sound a little, um, at times sound a little squishy, um, I, I don't wanna say that, even bigger than that, that the role and purpose is not trivial. In life, we want our role and our purpose to be aimed at something bigger. And one way to put it is a common good. This is not an idea that's very, common in American society today. 
if you're in a religious community, you might know about it. If you work at a school, you probably know about it. If you belong to any strong community institution, there is that. That's really what builds a, a, a powerful institution of civil society, in my view, is the idea that people are working together on a common project, that the project is good and above and outside of themselves. In the military, it's crystal clear what your mission is, what your project is, what is the common good. You land in this world and it's not always clear. The idea that there is a common good sometimes gets laughed at. It's, it's thought to be sort of, you know, a, a childish idea that there's a common good. You should be in it to serve yourself because everybody else is in it to serve yourself. That can be the attitude. Um, that's the attitude of our politics. That's the attitude of a lot of our economics. Um, things are zero sum and there is no common good. So if that's what a lot of our world is like, and if what we as people who have the good luck of being plugged into organizations, what we're doing is building a good life for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren by belonging to church groups, to uh, philanthropy groups, to all sorts of things. If we want to help veterans coming home, we have to say, how can we get them this most valuable thing that I have? And so it's tricky. That was a huge part of what the American Legion and the VFW halls were. Now, nowadays though, um, first of all, veterans are more likely to be single than they were uh, back then. Uh, so they're more likely to wanna to be on a dating scene if they're going out. They're, um, maybe they are, and when they are married, uh, married, Dads are less likely to hang out at the bar than they were a couple generations ago. That's a good idea, but it, it, it speaks to the idea that um, these lounges might not be the, the sort of wave of, of the future for this sort of thing. I, I've looked at a, a handful of, um, of the newer kind of post 9-11 veteran organizations, and what jumped out at me was how much they use these words, mission and community. Uh, the mission continues is uh, is one group, and I mean they're they're one of their mottos is reporting for duty in your community. So we have to think about that for a second. This is a nonprofit where what they do is they give you a fellowship. They have I think about three hundred of them a year. They give you a fellowship to become a full time servant to your community. They are helping you, the veteran, by saying, "Here, you now have a role." We're giving you more work to help you. We're, we're making you a full-time volunteer, a community leader, that sort of thing in order to help you. And because it's set in a specific community, I mean, I've got no uh, bones with, uh, you know, Habitat for Humanity type groups that hop, skip and jump around the, around the country. That builds a community in a certain way. But some of these, it's saying, this is where you're saying, you are, the work you're doing is planting your roots further in and you're becoming as you guys talked about in, in earlier panels, you're becoming a community leader. And suddenly you have a role, you have a purpose. What you, the, the sort of bonds you had in the military, you're never gonna get exactly there um, to, to that level of intimacy. Um, but you're also going to, you will get lots of connection. Um, there are others that, again, it's about team building. What, what's uh, team red, white, and blue entering into marathons, road races, et cetera. Um, as a team, what these guys are doing is saying, this is about building connection and engaging in some joint undertaking. Now, a marathon, a, a Spartan race is not of the same sort of thing as uh, building up the community. It's not a common good thing so much as it's a, it is still an important joint and undertaking at a, at a, a common goal. Um, and that's the sort of thing that creates these lasting connections. I was talking to one uh, West Point grad today who told me about one of his fellow West Point guy, um, Iraq and Afghanistan. And when he came home, just deeply, deeply depressed um, and got, uh, ended up upstate. And the most important thing was that when the military helped him find a counselor, and we definitely need these very 
like, you know, professional services. Services are very crucial. The military, VA are supposed to try to provide them. I don't know how thorough they are in there. But the counselor knew that it was his job to get them together with a bunch of other guys, other vets for a poker night, and then expand the circle a little bit more beyond just local vets. And it reminded me when I was talking to this West Point guy today, he said, the, the counselor sort of pulled them back from the edge, but it was the being immersed, like somebody saying, I'm going to get you a bunch of buddies right now. That was what really made his friend be whole again. And it reminded me of when I was talking to a woman who had been a social worker her whole life. And she said, my main realization is that programs don't really help people. Relationships do. So the good programs are the ones that get people into relationships that build them friendships and help them plant roots in the community. So how do you do that? I'm a journalist. I'm, a, I'm sort of a, a problems guy more than a solutions guy. So I can just sort of articulate that uh, this framework of helping, I would help veterans find community, find a role that's aimed at the common good. Give them work to do that's not busy work, um, but that is really aimed at the common good, that builds community, that plants their roots in the community. Now, when I talk about it that way, you might start to hear this has to be a local thing. Uh, the mission continues is a national organization, but the grants go to somebody to do something in a place. Place, physical proximity, attachment to a community. These aren't things that you can just sub in and out. It's not like, you know, a, a closer in Major League Baseball who can do the same work in Oakland that he does in Queens, that he does in Miami. It, there's got to be something lasting about this. So it could be that the organizations that are going to do this well are going to be different and have different approaches in different parts of the country. It's one of the things that I, I really came to realize writing Alienated America is that there are, there's no one big solution to the problem of alienation. You can't have a federal department of local community cohesion. You can't have, I don't think, a national charity that makes everybody love their neighbor, right? Um, but you can have big efforts to help local organizations try to do this and then maybe help them communicate about best practices and, and that sort of thing. So that's sort of my framework for what I would think is the sort of thing. And many of these organizations exist out there um, to help veterans is say, what you've lost was camaraderie, a role, purpose, and daily engagement for the common good. Now, VA can get you money and hopefully when they're, uh, when they're competent healthcare, what philanthropy has to do is return to you that camaraderie, that role, that purpose, and that daily work to the common good. So that's, uh, I, I welcome more questions from you. Um, uh, to start with the, the first question here, um, is the general alienation in the population Dri uh, driving workaholism, especially applied to veterans. Could this also imply why the transition from active duty to retirement is very difficult for veterans? Yes. When this is exactly connected to the loss of purpose and the loss of role. I was just talking to a man uh, in Western Pennsylvania, Bob, uh, in Uniontown at a bar called Smitty's, and he hasn't been able to work during the coronavirus shutdown. And he said, well, I'm ready to retire but I'm not really gonna retire. He kept talking about how he's about to retire, but he's like, now once I can get back to work, I'm getting back to work. And then I'll officially retire, but I'll still keep doing jobs. And I asked him why, he said, you retire, you die. Now that's a glum way to look at things. If you have grandkids, if you have lots of, you need lots of other purposes to um, functions, roles, et cetera, to replace it. But yeah, if you're coming back from the military, and you don't see a role in the community, you don't have uh, a spouse, you don't have children, you could see people working themselves way too hard. Now, the thing is, I think that work is and can be meaningful no matter what it is. I'm a Catholic, I believe that any work you do, you can offer up to God. Um, now that said, a lot of, for a lot of people, the workplace is either purely transactional, meaning, I give you my labor, you give me cash, 
or the workplace is all consuming. And sometimes it's all consuming, not because that's what your boss demands, but as, as a question suggests, because you need to fill your empty hours um, in that. So I, I would definitely see that if, if sort of workaholism among veterans, which leads to an unhappiness, that that's driven by the same sort of alienation. Tim, thank you so much. And I, I love what you said just a few minutes ago about you can't create a federal department of community cohesion. It's just not gonna work. Um, but what role can local civic institutions, whether it's churches or um, we've seen a decline in VSO participation, um, obviously individuals aren't just hanging out at the local watering hole. Um, what are some, I know you said you're great at identifying problems and talking about problems, but in your experience talking with individuals across the country and learning about different organizations, how do those local civic institutions reach out to veterans? Mm -hmm. Do you, is it a partnership with um, like, uh, yeah, just like your local organizations? Like how, how do you propose for those philanthropists on this call to work with their civic institutions to reach out proactively to veterans in their community given their incredible skill and asset? Yeah, now, so this is, this is one of the things that I've seen um, uh, uh, some of these newer veterans organizations, as well as the older ones, um, becoming is saying a large part of our role is to be the one that any other group calls when they say, hey, this employer, I want to hire veterans. Can you tell me who they are? Or my parish, like, again, I would run a grill alongside my t-ball. I would love to just reach out to the, we have a VFW and an American Legion. And this spring, if I, uh, if we're allowed to socially gather, that, that's my plan is to call them and say, we need somebody to run the grill. Can you, you know, get me three guys every Friday to, to fry the fish or flip the burgers? Um, that's the, the, the existing groups, the VSOs or uh, Team Red, White and Blue Wounded Warrior Project that it's, I've seen some of them describe part of their roles as being exactly that, the clearinghouse of people who, who say that. And then ideally we could plant that seed in the mind of other nonprofits. Wait a second, some of this is gonna be logistical uh, work. Let's get some military guys to figure out the logistics of this, uh, of this project. Or again, an employer um, looking to hire somebody part-time or full-time those existing organizations become the place where you call and you say, hey, give me the names of some some veterans around here, whether it's a 75 year old guys to flip the burgers or the 30 year old guys to run the logistical operation you've got going on. Do you see the role of technology? Technology obviously has had, uh, some have talked about it has actually increased alienation. So you yep. have sort of looser connections with individuals. Can you use technology as a means to connect individuals almost, whether it's using geo fencing to kind of push, hey, you have this really cool volunteer opportunity. Um, and is there a role for philanthropy in, in, in spurring that? See, I, I think there is because the, the, the example you just kind of gave there is the way I would think about it. Technology, I think on net today, erodes community and adds to alienation. It draws us away from the people around us as we can just sit in the same room as them and, and, and stare at the phone. Um, it draws us into caring more. I, more people know who like Michael Avenatti and Michael Cohen are than know who their, uh, their local councilman or, or, or state senator or county executive is. Um, in part because of our constant attachment to technology, the centralization, over-centralization of our attention, et cetera. Where technology does the most work is, I believe, when it facilitates physical getting together. You just can't replace it. And if you've, if you've been on the next door or one of these email lists, they can be nice, but they can also lead to more cattiness in part because when you're not seeing a person as a person, you're more likely to be 
a little bit nasty. So technology serving to get people physically together. Mm-hmm. Are there, there are already some apps that sort of try to do this? It's like physically who's around you to do whatever, to do a pickup app. I think there's an app called Nextdoor that yeah, so, kind I mean, of helps it does a little door, bit of that, yeah. And they try to do it, but it's not optimized necessarily towards physically getting together. I mean, this goes way back, right? Meetup was something in like 2004 that people uh-huh. were trying to do. If you're in this, these five zip codes, you're going to do it. Um, and I haven't seen any that really, any apps or anything that really take it to the next level where like, I, I was just saying of pick up basketball. Like, what if I just said, I'm interested in put like, it would almost, I guess, be like a dating app. I'm interested in pick up basketball. These are the times that I can play. These are the courts that I can play at. And then when I was a kid, you had to call people. Well, okay, you'll play, but we only got three people. We need to get at least six. And you were, an app could do it. Be like, boom, you've got six guys at 8 p.m. on Tuesday, go. Um, and you'd have to include like their vertical and their height. So there's not too much of a mismatch, I imagine. But that could be done with any sort of, either volunteering or, or that kind of thing. There are some gig economy uh, apps that try to do this, but again, my thought, my goal would be to create lasting bonds and a sense of purpose and not just something that's purely transactional. We had team red, white, and blue on earlier, and that is something sort of the idea of health and wellness and building a sense of community um, it, through exercise often. Um, And it has had a tremendous effect, I think, for the 230 some individuals that have become 230,000 individuals that are affiliated with Team Red, White, and Blue. And there's leadership capability and um, sort of like helping engage individuals. And there's certainly organization. We had Team Rubicon and helping individuals apply their skill set to times of need. obviously that sense of common purpose, that camaraderie, that giving back. But I- um, And that can be so educational to the rest of the community, right? Like a lot of us show up at something thinking I'm gonna get something out of this. We join a swimming pool because of the enjoyment, et cetera, that we get out of it. And there are some people who set for us the example, oh wait, no, I'm giving to this. This is something I belong to. This is something I owe my efforts and concerns to besides just my dues. And that um, idea of mission and common purpose can be made more explicit when your members are and include veterans. Yeah, we earlier, we had, um, we talked about more of civics and civic education, the role of veterans to engage in civics education and sort of the sense of purpose, you know, they've fought for our country and our values. They volunteered, they signed up and made their pledge to defend our country. Um, What do you see, how do you see perhaps getting veterans more involved in teaching? Um, There's a a level of leadership and adaptability and um, how do you see veterans as playing a larger role in perhaps being teachers and how do we recruit them into the classroom? So, I mean, this is a tricky thing because full-time teachers in public school systems, there's tons of uh, prerequisites and hoops and that sort of thing. And it'd be a great thing for state and county governments to try to make uh, more flexibility. I'd like more flexibility across the board, but this could be a place to start, right? Um, Making it easier for uh, veterans to land in a classroom, even if they don't have the, you know, whatever training it is, et cetera, that the, the county or state is demanding of, of every other teacher, provide them the training that they need, we don't require them to jump through all the other hoops. So that would be a policy reform that does have to happen. And, and veterans could certainly be on the, on the leading edge of that. And on private schools, religious schools, those sorts of things. Um, I, my children's uh, private schools are very dedicated to uh, character formation um, mm-hmm. and that idea of mission and common good that uh, that military folks pick up is something that would be 
directly in the mission of these schools. And I think with a lot of uh, a lot of private schools, especially religious ones, that's central to it. And my boys school, it's, you know, geared towards you're we're going to give you the virtues of manhood and that nothing would be more exciting to them than having a teacher who, you know, they'd prefer it if the person had, you know, fought with breastplates and swords, but they'll take modern day military if they, if they have to. I love that. I love that. Um, <laughs> um, in this time of COVID and, you know, there's increased social isolation, um, there are some donors that are on this call who have been extraordinarily generous in responding to the immediate need, you know, providing tech for kids uh, that have been displaced and are learning from home or internet connection or um, individuals have, you know, provided resources for uh, local food banks for new emergency yep. food. Some have done emergency cash assistance. How in this time of disconnectedness um, do you recommend that philanthropists think about veterans as assets in community and sort of creating that connective tissue that you talked about earlier? Is there a way to sort of that funders themselves can help bring them in or is it supporting a nonprofit that has a particular lens toward bringing veteran volunteers in to sort of deploy their skill set out into the community? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that there's some, I'm bracing for a second wave. I hope it doesn't come, but the numbers where I live are going in the wrong direction right now. Um, and so there's some infrastructure that needs to be built to help us get through this. I was just thinking about this, um, how when I wanted to get out of my house and get work done, I was looking for a coffee shop. And coffee shops aren't necessarily built for this because I was in a parking lot to be outside and it was the sun is beating down on this was back in July and the sun was beating down on me even now when it's cooler I don't like the sun beating down on me and I was at a park and there was like um uh, a, a big giant gazebo with picnic tables and I just thought it wouldn't be that hard it wouldn't be that expensive to get some wi-fi and uh electrical in this place you space the tables out a little more and mm -hmm. suddenly you're doing a service to your community. You could have every one of these things in a county and then students work from home, parents, et cetera, out there having something that they're not shelling out $8 for a, a latte for, but also it can be more custom built for serving these unique needs. Like literally a place that has shade, electricity and an outlet. I wasted yeah. hours looking for that. I'm going to be fine, but there's a lot of people for whom that might be a much bigger burden, especially if they want to bring their kids there and have them learn. So I was thinking county government or philanthropy should be saying, how can we help people in an outdoor spaced out setting get what they need? Um, but the infrastructure involved in that seems mm -hmm. like this is a good opportunity for roping in veterans who you know have experience with logistics, with teamwork, with, uh, with that sort of thing. Yeah, what a great suggestion. I appreciate that. Well, Tim, um, we are so grateful for uh, just your time today and just, just articulating the need for that sense of community and common purpose, that sense of engagement. Uh, before we close, do you have any parting thoughts for our audience? Uh, no, I'll just, I'll just reiterate, I mean, Thank you all for looking for ways to support veterans. You're also supporting community. And I would just remind you, that's the same, that's the same mission right there, supporting veterans by plugging them into community, giving them the opportunity. I know a lot of people, uh, philanthropists say, this is great for me to have the opportunity to help others. That's how you can help veterans often is give them the opportunity to help others. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Tim, for your time today. If you have any questions about the content that you heard over the last few sessions, please follow up with my colleague, Sean Riley. Um, his email is s-r-i-e-l-e-y at philanthropyroundtable.org. So with that, thank you all again. Many thanks to my colleague, Sean and Mary Margaret for their incredible execution. And
thank you to all of our speakers for joining us. Without, thank you. Bye-bye.